go ahead and record today. And I want to thank you all for being here. Welcome to the Ollie Brownbag presentation about Iceland, volcanoes, glaciers, waterfalls, and puffins with Raleigh Lamerson. Um, we will just get started here in just a minute, but today's brown bag presentation is made possible because of the generous support of the Friends of Ollie. Um, the gifts of the Friends of Ollie uh, make it possible to continue um, for us to offer lifelong learning opportunities for everyone in our community. Um, you came in muted and we're gonna ask you to keep yourself muted during the presentation today. Um, if you would like to ask questions, please wait for Raleigh to um, pause in his, in his presentation and he will ask um, um, for questions. You can put them in the chat at any time though. Um, thank you again for being here and um, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Jane to introduce our guest today. Thank you. And we're very happy to uh, welcome Raleigh Lamberson, who is a retired HSU mathematics professor ranch owner, fine furniture designer and woodworker, and world traveler, as you'll see. He's going to escort us on a trip around Iceland's Highway 1, the Ring Road, which completely circles the island. And Raleigh, it's all yours. Thank you, Jane. <clears throat> well, some of you may wonder why one would want to travel to Iceland. Uh, last April, Michelle and I were camping with friends in Death Valley. And on a very hot day, uh, we began to talk about Iceland, the contrast in the, uh, Iceland's weather with the 100 degree in the shade in Death Valley seemed to be appropriate. And by the end of that trip, we'd planned a trip to Iceland. So you get the advantage of seeing what we saw uh, while we were there. The uh, Ring Road in Iceland, as Jane said, circles the island. We uh, spent two weeks making that trek. Uh, very interesting and a beautiful ride around the island. And uh, wonderful when you're traveling 800 miles in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So you get plenty of time to stop and look at things and go hiking and do various other things. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I can't advance. It's not working for you to advance. They won't, the slides are not advancing. You may need to um, stop sharing and then share again. If that, if you might have just um, timed out or something. Okay, we are back. Anyway, Iceland. And if you go to Iceland, there is plenty of ice, as you can see from the, uh, the photograph. Glacier is coming down off of the uh, ice cap, which covers much of the center of the country. But there are lots of other things. Uh, there are beautiful little villages along the uh, harbors uh, all around the country. Uh, fishing is one of the major uh, economic drivers of the country. And these are wonderful little fishing villages. Reykjavik, which is the capital, is the uh, uh, metropolitan center and population center of the entire country. More than half of the population lives in Reykjavik. And <clears throat> it has, uh, is much more cosmopolitan than one might expect. It has some really interesting architecture, which you can see at the end of the street. This is Rainbow Street, as you uh, can notice. The, uh, the uh, main cathedral in the country is this, which sits at the end of Rainbow Street. The architecture is uh, uh, the architecture comes 
basically from the columns that are formed in basalt, basalt lava when it, uh, when it uh, solidifies. We will see some of that later. There's beautiful architecture in, in Reykjavik, lots of interesting modern buildings. There's been lots of development in very recent times. As you can see from this, uh, this building, which is uh, sitting right on the harbor. And there's funky architecture also. Uh, buildings which have interesting paintings and so on. And some that hark back to uh, the uh, more distant past with sod roofs. Uh, in the rural areas, you see some actual functioning sod roofs. This one is probably more for decoration. And you see wonderful public art. Mm -hmm. uh, this of course harks back to the, the Vikings. Uh, the history of, of Iceland starts, well, it's, it is in dispute as to exactly when it starts, but the Norse arrived in Iceland in about 870, uh, about 1200 years ago. Anyway, <clears throat> so we are uh, new compared to Iceland. It's uh, been, a, been a country for, for nearly 1200 years. The uh, uh, Norse actually formed tribal groups and settled the island. Uh, developed a parliament which started meeting back in 930. They, uh, the chieftains from each of the tribal groups were their representatives and they met once a year to settle on what the rules of behavior were going to be and settle disputes between groups. Eric the Red was Icelandic and uh, he went on to colonize Greenland back in about uh, 986. Uh, Icelandic, or Iceland became uh, a Christian country in the year 1000, uh, kind of forced on them. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, has remained a, uh, a Christian country to this time and you will see uh, churches in every community. It is a national uh, church and each of those are in beautiful repair, uh, funded by the federal government. The, uh, the North that founded the country uh, reconnected with Norway back in the uh, early 1200s, and it became kind of a colony of uh, Norway uh, by, the, by the 1300s, and uh, was uh, then more or less colonized by Denmark because Denmark began to dominate all of the, the uh, Scandinavian countries uh, by uh, the uh, 1380s. That's not the case. By the 1600s is when Denmark really began to dominate. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, volcanic history of uh, Iceland basically begins with the uh, uh, devastating eruption of a, of a uh, volcano called Lackey in 1783. Uh, that, uh, oh, after all of the after effects of the eruption and the change in climate caused by the cloud of ash that hung over for a huge long time. Uh, 
Hey, Molly, this is Kim. I'm sorry to interrupt. Have you been advancing your slides? So I'm, I'm not seeing that. It looks okay. I my slide is on a uh, uh, Viking ship, uh, an abstract version of a okay. Viking ship. Okay, no, that's where it is. That's exactly okay. where it is. I'm sorry. I, I thought you might have been advancing the slides. Nope. No. Nope. Pardon uh, the interruption. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, the uh, eruption of Lackey went on for uh, actually in, into the, the following year, several months, and killed off about 30% of the population of, of uh, Iceland, as well as uh, a lot of people throughout Europe. Uh, and as we know now, there have been later uh, eruptions that have disturbed not only Iceland, but Europe with prevention of air travel and so on. Uh, Iceland became an autonomous country back right after uh, uh, World War I. Denmark had kind of lost interest in having to deal with Iceland. Uh, during World War II, they finally gave Iceland its independence. But uh, during the war, Iceland was occupied by uh, the US. We saw it as strategically important to the war effort. And uh, we had about 50,000 troops uh, in Iceland for the period of the war, not particularly well received by the Icelanders. Uh, the population of Iceland at the time was only about 120,000 and putting 50,000 uh, young men uh, into that population was not well received. Uh, we actually had occupying troops there up in through the 50s, but Iceland formally became independent in 1945. Uh, more recently, uh, Iceland, the economy of Iceland really collapsed uh, in the 2008 uh, economic crisis. And uh, uh, what is astonishing is the recovery that they have made from that. Well, this is a map of Iceland and the gray areas are ice, permanent ice. So huge areas of, of permanent ice. Reykjavik sits over here. The currently erupting volcano is right over about here, uh, less than 20 miles away from Reykjavik. And the road we're going to travel is this red path, which travels along here. Uh, up along this edge. I'm not going to follow all the zigzags, uh, but across some of the highlands, then we will actually divert from that, uh, the ring road and circle a couple of these fingers and then make our way back to Reykjavik. The uh, brown and tan areas are highlands. They are basically unoccupied. They, are, uh, they look like wastelands, uh, either that or they're covered with ice. The uh, coastal plains are the areas in green, uh, which are uh, agricultural. They, they raise horses and sheep, uh, <clears throat> a few cattle, but not many. This is our trusty steed that we use to travel uh, around the country. It's a, a Renault uh, travel van. It simply has, uh, folds out into a queen size bed in the back of it. It has a little cabinet with a sink. We had a uh, portable camp stove and uh, uh, a, a little foldable table and two chairs and that's, some pots and pans, and that was pretty much the extent of what we 
what we had. Uh, the rental agency we got it from uh, said that they had 400 vans that they rent. So it's a popular way to go. Uh, we did not go out to the erupting volcano. Here, here is a photograph of it uh, early on. It started the eruption in March, but <clears throat> at the time we were there, uh, the uh, lava flow had gotten several miles away from the volcano itself and cut off the hiking path to get into it. So we did not make an attempt to hike to the mountain. We did get to see waterfalls. There are waterfalls uh, all along the route because you have this central ice cap. Uh, you have lots of melting during the summer and lots of runoff and it run off, runs off in all directions. And since the decline from the, the uh, hilltops is quite precipitous, you get waterfalls. And sometimes you can see several at one point. This is our first campsite. The uh, uh, campsites typically were open fields. Uh, there would be a building which uh, housed uh, bathroom facilities, showers, uh, gave you access to the internet. Uh, it uh, was basically then open country. Uh, beyond that, no marked sites, uh, no picnic tables or anything of that sort. You just moved in with your van and, and uh, picked your spot. Uh, we hiked up the little notch that you see in the background there. And there's this beautiful little stream, the waterfall coming down to form it. This is getting out <clears throat> on the coast and uh, giving you some examples of the columns, the basalt columns that I mentioned in relationship to the church. You see here uh, the uh, basalt forms these, uh, these columns as it solidifies as a result of the crystalline structure of the, the basalt and it leaves these wonderful formations. This is the, the roof of that uh, cavern. And you get to see other patterns also. This is not basalt. Uh, <clears throat> we went on, uh, the, next to our next campsite were these two, uh, I assume they're summer homes. Uh, anyway, beautifully situated and very attractive. Uh, again, a sod roof. They, uh, it's uh, not unusual once you get out in the countryside to see sod roofs on houses. And in the campground, we saw some uh, campers that were a little more formidable than our own. This one uh, is a Mercedes four wheel drive of some heft, I assume it's used for camping up in the in the highlands. This is Einar. We had booked a uh, a puffin tour. We had wanted to uh, see and photograph puffins, and Einar owns a ranch. Uh, a ranch that has been in the family since 1600. Uh, he says he has relatives who say that, in fact, it had been in the, in the family since the 1400s, but he's not sure about that. Anyway, <clears throat> he uh, is not only a farmer rancher, he uh, also uh, offers puffin tours. There is a uh, big rock uh, at the edge of the, of the ocean 
uh, adjacent to his property and he has this tractor and wagon and he loads you into it and drives you through three or four miles of marshy uh, black sand country to uh, get out to this rock to see puffins. And as we were about to uh, depart for our trip out to the rock, uh, another carload of people arrived. They had been supposed to have been there at 10 o'clock. Uh, it was 1030. Uh, we were all loaded up and started to uh, move out to the rock and uh, this van pulled up, a lady jumped out of it yelling to wait and waving her arms and Einar turned around, looked at her and said, come back tomorrow and hit the throttle and we were off. I don't know what they did. I don't know if they came back tomorrow. This is the rock, the rock is probably, I don't know, several hundred feet high and probably a mile and a half or two miles long. And on top of it, not only do you have puffins, you have Einar sheep. As many of the uh, ranchers there, they have lots of sheep, quite handsome sheep, in fact. This is an old, uh, sorting pen that his ancestors used to handle their sheep. And this is a skua, predatory bird that picks on uh, uh, puffin chicks and puffin eggs if it can. And there are puffins, lots of puffins. There are, I have no idea what the population, but many thousands of them out there. And puffins are kind of the clowns of the uh, bird kingdom. The nice thing about puffins, they don't uh, seem to be afraid of humans at all. Uh, you can get about as close to them as you want to. They don't seem to fly away at all. They pose for you. They <clears throat> live primarily on these cliff sides. As you can see, this we're probably 300 feet, 400 feet from the ocean uh, up here. You can vaguely see it in the background. And uh, the puffins, this is an area where they nest. These dark areas that you see are the mouths of, of uh, the nesting cavities. They nest back in cavities in the the cliff side. They uh, are very nice to pose for you. And uh, this one, I in fact have lots of pictures of these three as they were doing various things. You can even get nice pictures of them when they're flying. And uh, there are lots of them flying. Of course, there's one, but there in the background are dozens more flying. It's not quite like mosquitoes in Nebraska, but uh, there are uh, lots of them in the air at any given moment. And then you get to hike back down this. Uh, uh, this is the black sands. It's lava, actually, which is uh, broken up into sand as it hits the, uh, when the uh, volcanoes erupt under the uh, glaciers, the uh, lava often breaks up into a kind of coarse sand. And that's, that's what you see here. It's quite interesting to hike in it. Uh, not a lot of fun. Anyway, there's our ride back. Uh, if anyone has any questions, this would be a good time to jump in. I don't see anyone with their hand raised or any questions in the chat. Okay. Well, <clears throat> oh, yeah. Wait, Charles, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Raleigh, it's great to see you again, and thank you for giving this presentation. 
my first question is about your first camping area that you stopped at. You said they were pretty uh, plain, but there were a couple of facilities there for showers and bathroom. Was there a charge for those? Uh, yeah, they typically cost about $20 or something. You know, I was probably, well, they varied from about $20 to $30 to camp. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And the other one is just a comment. On the first uh, volcano scene that you showed, there was a bunch of ice around it, and there were several people that were around there. Uh, Icelanders like to use that as a, they call it an Icelandic barbecue. Uh, they'll bring their food and stuff out there in a big uh, aluminum pot or foil and put their food on uh, hot lava and barbecue their food that way. Did you happen to see any of that or? No, we didn't get out. We didn't get out to the lava flow at all. So we didn't see that, but yes, indeed, they like to do that. <laughs> Okay, well, there are you. some questions here now in the chat. Okay. Um, I see um, one question is, which direction did you travel, clockwise or counterclockwise? Uh, we traveled, we traveled counterclockwise. Uh, we traveled from Reykjavik southeast across the southern border, then up uh, the side, uh, the east side, and across the, across the northern side with a lot of zigzagging as we were on the northern side since we went out on some of those kind of fingers that you see on the map and then back down to Reykjavik. Um, excuse me, another question is, what about the cost of food? The cost of food? Food is expensive. So uh, be, if you go, be prepared because uh, it is, uh, well, I've been recently in Nebraska where food is relatively cheap compared to what it is here in Arcata. Uh, well, it is not only more expensive than Nebraska, it's substantially more expensive than Arcata. But food just overall is probably twice as expensive as, as it would be here. So, um... There's a little uh, addition to the question about the direction that you were traveling. Um, Sherman wants to know, was that direction that was recommended or did you flip a coin? Um, that seems to be the direction everybody goes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are sites people want to see immediately and that's kind of the direction they are, are in. And uh, so you head okay. off first to see the puffins, then to see the, get good views of the glaciers and so on. Right. Um, Carl asks, does it get a lot of rainfall? Uh, it rained a couple of days. Uh, we were in Reykjavik the first couple of days and it rained on us while we were there, not really unpleasantly, but uh, we were able to uh, you know, do usual tourist things, but uh, it did rain a couple of days. While we were camping, we never had rain. That was amazing. That's great. Um, I, I think I saw Ted had his hand up. Yeah, Ted, go ahead. I, <clears throat> I don't have anything related to this trip, but I have a funny story about polar bears in Iceland. Polar bears are not uh, native to Iceland, so... Uh, that's especially important. And I knew a woman who wanted to be a faculty member at the university in Reykjavik. And she made an appointment with the professor there to meet him to talk about the job. And when she got there, they told her that he couldn't meet his appointment because he had a polar bear on his porch and he lived out in the country. And uh, so it turns out that the polar bear had swum from Greenland and was on his porch. And they didn't have any way to deal with it. They don't know what to do with polar bears. And so they flew in somebody from Denmark to anesthetize him and get him out of the way. Yeah, 
polar bears are not native to Iceland. I've always <laughs> wanted to see a polar bear in the wild, uh, but never have. There is uh, an area in uh, far northern Iceland where on occasion, uh, polar bears do show up, usually riding an ice flow uh, over from Greenland, but uh, uh, we didn't get to see one, even though I wanted to. We have a couple more questions. Um, one is, how much of the ice cap has been lost to the extra heat? How much uh, of the ice cap has been lost to? The extra heat. Oh, to... Uh, that's a good question for which I do not have an answer. Okay. They are losing some uh, of the ice due to global warming, but uh, uh, to what extent? I don't, I don't think it is to the extent that you would see a shrinking of the size, but you would probably see a shrinking of the height of the because the ice cap is many hundreds of feet thick. Got it. Thank you. And then um, one last question is about agriculture um, and what kind of vegetables um, do they grow there? Are they imported? Do they have um, uh, other than animal husbandry? What what do they have going on? Uh, as far as vegetables, they're grown in greenhouses. Um, it's the uh, growing season is just too short for, for most vegetables, uh, most crops, in fact. Uh, agriculture is primarily raising horses, raising sheep, uh, and raising hay to feed them over the winter. I'll show you a couple farms later. Perfect. I think, um, oh wait, there's a quick another question. Did you go to any hot tubs? Did we? Yes. Well, <laughs> if you call a, you know, hot spring or whatever, uh, that is probably five acres, a hot tub. Why? Yeah. We, and it's very nice to go swimming around in, in them. There are a number available. They're very popular. Lots of people uh, uh, are attracted to them and we, we took advantage of it. Thanks, I think that's it for now. Okay, well, this is, is one of the many, many, many glaciers uh, coming off the ice cap. This is off of that largest of the uh, uh, national parks, the ar largest part of the ice cap. Here is another glacier. Uh, it is huge, it must be, uh, 15 or 20 miles across the, uh, the mouth of the, the glacier itself. The glaciers frequently dump into uh, lakes. Uh, you get icebergs floating around in the lakes. Uh, you can see a couple of glaciers in the background here. One big one and one not quite so big. Uh, <clears throat> But that's where the ice is coming from. And if you're a tourist, you can take a, a tour boat out to actually visit one of the icebergs. Notice the blue color uh, in this, this particular iceberg. Mm -hmm. The uh, ice that has been deep down into uh, the glaciers and compressed develops that uh, blue color. You don't have to take a boat out. This is just a picture of part of an iceberg that's on the beach. So uh, you can see them without taking a boat. Not everything goes right when you're uh, uh, doing a trip like this. And uh, here we're trying to figure out how the jack, where the jack fits to uh, change a flat tire. We ultimately figured it out and, and got the tire changed and fixed. That was actually the only problem we had uh, during the course of the trip. Here's a, uh, another campground complete with our laundry, uh, <clears throat> but you can see how the land rises up to the, uh, the uh, heights of the central part of the, of the country. Uh, it's not 
that the central part is terribly high. It's, you know, a couple thousand feet, maybe a little more than that, uh, higher than the coastal plain, but, but not terribly high. Uh, we're traveling one day and up over a ridge and uh, as we peeked over the ridge, this waterfall was lying in uh, down in the valley below us. Why I didn't stop and take a picture of it from the ridge, I have no idea because it would have made a great photograph, but this is taken from down by the waterfall. This uh, waterfall flows uh, is one of the biggest of all the waterfalls in Europe. And when, when you're in Iceland and you are comparing things, they're always saying this is the best or the second best in all of Europe. They are usually not saying how it is in Iceland, but how it compares with what is, is going on in Europe. But this flows a lot of water. And uh, you know it's comparable to uh, Niagara Falls not quite as high, but almost, and probably uh, flowing as much water as Niagara Falls does. After that, we did a, uh, a uh, trip up over uh, the uh, highland. And the, uh, this is a, a restaurant, uh, a little restaurant and lodge uh, up in the highlands. This is sod which they use to insulate it. It gets cold up there. And uh, anyway, <clears throat> we uh, spent a bit of time hiking around in that area. It is barren country once you get up in the highlands. The NASA used that area to train astronauts who were going to the moon. They needed to train them to uh, uh, do geological surveys uh, in an area that didn't have any vegetation. Uh, so uh, the highlands in Iceland were, were suitable for that. It's, a, it's kind of a vast wasteland. This was my lunch at that restaurant. Mm. Uh, waffles are a big deal. They love waffles and uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, the waffles are great. I forgot now what kind of berries, there's a berry jam on the, on the plate. I forgot now what it was, but it was quite wonderful. Anyway, there are other traditional foods. Michelle chose a moss soup. So this is the moss soup. It has a, a milk base. It's kind of sweet and is not something that uh, I would order again. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you, it made her lunch. I didn't try to steal any from her. As I mentioned earlier, there's lots of little beautiful churches in each of these towns. Uh, if it's a small town, they almost always look like this. Uh, as we get to bigger towns, they get to be a bit more formidable like this. Uh, this is one of the uh, towns, the town they call the capital of the north. Anyway, this is the church in that town. Uh, a very impressive edifice, but if you look at the sanctuary, it is like all the rest of them. Uh, <clears throat> as you get to the uh, east and particularly to the north, uh, all the communities are fishing communities. And you have these wonderful old fishing boats like this one, or you have modern new fishing boats like this one. This one you may not uh, think of as a uh, normal fishing boat. You know it has, notice it has a blunt nose. It's much taller than you would expect. Uh, the reason for that is the rules for size of fishing boats uh, limit the length of the boat. Uh, so they make them wide rather than long. And uh, 
you can build them up high uh, because that doesn't count against the length. They also limit the horsepower and the sonar equipment that go on them. So they, this boat was carefully fitted out to maximize everything uh, uh, in the rules uh, for the uh, uh, fishing boats themselves. You see lots of the fishermen who have just small boats. This is in another little harbor. And uh, these are just the small boats that fishermen use to go out and catch. Typically, they're catching pollock and cod. This is the uh, uh, Coast Guard Center. Lots of uh, Coast Guard vessels because there are lots of people who get in trouble and need to be rescued. So they, uh, they have plenty of people to help them out. Here they're unloading a small fishing vessel. The vessel itself is hidden behind that crane, uh, but that crane is lifting a crate of uh, fish out. You see it in the foreground, a, a couple of crates full of these fish. Uh, it's hard to imagine the amount of fish that one of these boats can bring in. This guy is sorting fish, sorting pollock from cod. Cod is more valuable. And this is uh, one of the workmen in the warehouse holding a, a very nice cod. Uh, a couple of the women in the group wanted to take the workmen home with us. But this is an old fishing village. We traveled off to where a ghost town, they were we were told there was a ghost town. It was where a fishing village had been, but had been abandoned about 1930. Uh, all the buildings had been sawed. You can see the sod wall and uh, the stone foundation under it. They were dug down a bit and then built up with sod, which is actually quite, quite warm. Sod is a good insulation. It was built along this harbor this harbor is not nearly as protected as most of them that you see in the uh, fishing villages that have continued. And that may be part of the reason for the demise of it. But the interesting thing about it was each of these ruins had a plaque and the plaque described who had lived there, how long they had lived there, when they abandoned it and so on. And it, uh, they were still living here until about 1930. This is just some of the uh, uh, rock formations on the coastline. So again, some more of the basalt, but in this case it has a beautiful orange lichen growing on it. And this is what it looks like if you're walking around on the top of it. it looks like uh, some strange tile work in the floor. As you approach some of these uh, small towns, you uh, uh, often see these little characters uh, waiting to greet you. They're basically painted rocks, but this has become a, a tradition in some of the small towns in the North to have greeters of, of this sort. And that's just, uh, their road was up on a cliff raised uh, a fair bit above sea level. So you could get a good expansive view of what, uh, what the coastline looked like. This is on the North Coast and it's, it's gorgeous out there. And if you look carefully down in the uh, lower right-hand uh, corner, you can see, uh, uh, I think a blue uh, jacket or something. There are three or four people down there, just little dots. 
who are picking berries. We saw lots of people out picking berries in, in the wild uh, while we were in that particular area. Another campground, more of the big four wheel drive campers. Uh, again, right behind it, it rises up into the highlands. Uh, <clears throat> this is a guy who has a, a garage for his boat, but it doesn't quite fit, I guess. We were walking around this community and, and uh, a uh, artist has his studio there. This is one of the pieces that he had on display. This is, uh, looks quite contemporary, but if you look back, there are artworks more or less of this sort, which are hundreds of years old in, in Iceland. Uh, so that uh, it, is, it is not exactly, uh, uh, well, it may look contemporary, but uh, has a history behind it. Another church, slightly bigger town, slightly bigger church. Here's one of the farms. Uh, as I said, they grow mostly sheep, horses, and hay. Uh, lots of hay because they need to feed their animals for the winter. And these white uh, marshmallow looking things are hay bales uh, wrapped in plastic to, to preserve them. But uh, they, uh, the hay bales weigh about 1200 pounds and they're the same kind of hay bales you see if you go back to my ranch in Nebraska. This is a horse ranch. And if you look carefully up uh, by the house, there are a number of horses there and out there's a pasture off to the right and there are a lot more horses there. And if you look further, you would see even more. Iceland has lots of horses. There are, <clears throat> there is a horse for about every fourth person in the country. Uh, the uh, Iceland horse is, uh, looks a lot like an American quarter horse as far as its conformation is concerned. They are uh, uh, <clears throat> a little bit smaller, uh, but not pony size. They, they're just a, a little bit smaller. They're 12 hands rather than 14 hands if you, if you uh, uh, are a horseman. Anyway, Iceland horses are a pure strain. They, these are the horses that the Norse brought over when they first settled Iceland. And uh, since that time, they have banned all importation of horses to the island so they can preserve uh, this pure strain of horses. And I was asking what they did with all the horses since there are so many of them and they are uh, obviously breeding more. Uh, it's a big export business. Uh, people like Iceland horses. Uh, so they, uh, a lot of them are exported. Uh, you can see lots of them in the US. They are gated. They have five gates rather than the three gates that we are uh, familiar with. Uh, they have this uh, wonderful gait, which is kind of like a trot, except the horse's legs uh, coordinate differently. And for those of you who've spent some time on horseback, as I have, a trot is a most uncomfortable gait. Uh, however, the Iceland horses, when uh, they are doing their tort, they, uh, uh, it's wonderfully smooth. And uh, anyway, it's a beautiful gait and it's, a, it's about the same speed as a canter on a, on a normal quarter horse. But um, anyway, they're wonderful to ride. They come in all colors. 
uh, every uh, herd of horses that I saw had this kind of variety of colors of horses. Uh, This would probably be a good time to take more questions if you have any. There are some questions. Um, first question I see is what about the use of your cell phones? Um, do they work well? Do you rent them? What, how, how did that work? Uh, we did lots of texting. Uh, <clears throat> so we have free texting when we're in places like that. So uh, I don't think we made a phone call, but uh, but text, yeah. yeah. Uh, whether we had uh, service everywhere, I don't know. But uh, everywhere, I guess that I don't remember not having service. A couple of people ask um, if you could tell us what time of the year were you there? Uh, we arrived in late July and left in early August. We were there for about. Uh, well, we returned on the 9th of August, so, you know, somewhere early 20th, uh, 20th of July is when we left. And there's lots of questions about the horses. Um, do they grow furrier coat in the winter? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're very fuzzy in the winter. Yeah. And did you ride horses while you were there? We did not, no. Uh, I would love to have but uh, it, the opportunity didn't present itself. And I guess I'm the only horseman in the group. <laughs> we, we were a group of eight people eight with people. four vans. And uh, anyway, uh, I was the one most interested in the horses. My father raised uh, quarter horses. Um, thank you. And then uh, how long are the days in July? Uh, long, gosh, uh, oh, you know, 11 o'clock at night, it's still perfectly light out, you know, the sun is down, but the sun kind of dips below the horizon and, and it remains quite light. Uh, I, I expect that at two o'clock in the morning, it's probably fairly light also. And then, um, what about burning peat for fuel? Is that was that the heat source? Uh, I I didn't see that. The heat source, uh, in a lot of cases, is geothermal. Hmm. They have all of these geyser basins, and they collect steam from it, and they pipe it up and down the road, and you know, heat whole towns with uh, uh, you know the ge geothermal heat. Well, I don't see anybody else have any questions. What purpose do the horses serve? Uh, I think people people ride them, they rent them to tourists, and they export them. I think it's uh, prim primarily raising horses for an export market. Uh, and uh, if looking at the horse ranches, they're doing very well at it. That's great. Um, just for um, just so you know, Cheryl um, shared an Icelandic horse gate video um, in the chat so people can can copy and, and watch that um, at their leisure. I don't see any other uh, any other questions. So I see a raised hand. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Go ahead. I, <clears throat> these horses look very similar to Mongolian horses. Are they related? Do you know? I don't think, well, I'm not sure where the Mongolian horses uh, came from, but they do indeed. I've been to Mongolia and uh, Rick Grimm and I are going to be talking about that in a couple of weeks, uh, but they certainly do look a lot like the Mongolian horses. Yeah. Thanks, Ted. I don't see anything else, Raleigh. Okay. Well, <clears throat> this is the currently erupting volcano. You can see uh, the, this is fairly early on. The, the uh, lava has gotten much further away from the, uh, the peak uh, now. Actually, it is 
currently pretty quiet, so it's not just spewing much lava. This is, this is a lava flow that you see here. And uh, you can see it's flowing down what looks like a uh, little stream bed. Uh, and that is typically, of, typically what happens. It finds the lowest area and flows down, often uh, completely choking out a stream or a river. Uh, but uh, if you look carefully in the background, you can see little tendrils of lava of what looks like uh, kind of gray green color. That's actually moss that you're seeing on it. The moss colonizes the lava, but uh, it comes, the lava comes down off of these cliffs looking a little bit like syrup being poured down it. This is the moss. It uh, covers huge areas in uh, particularly in the western part of uh, Iceland. There's a up close view of it. Uh, it is, this, this area is particularly, not particularly useful for farming or anything of that sort because it's almost completely covered with, with lava. Lava comes in other forms also. Uh, some of it is this angry, jagged looking uh, formations that, that you see here, which are not nice to go hiking through. As we went down the coast, we came upon this sculpture uh, honoring fishermen. Uh, I don't know anything of the history of it, but it was fascinated by the, the sculpture itself. You can see a person on the right hand side, give you some idea of the scale. It is a formidable piece of uh, artwork. The last night that we camped, uh, we camped at a campground on a farm. And this was one of our camping companions, was a very good, good companion, didn't get in the way, didn't bother us. Uh, we had others that came over to visit who, who were more curious. And uh, as goats do, they need to be up on the highest thing. I'm surprised we didn't see them up on the hoods of vehicles. But uh, anyway, they were, they were uh, uh, very curious little animals. Here you can see all the equipment we had, a couple of chairs, a little folding table, this is the camp stove, uh, some pots and pans, a uh, French press to make coffee. It's all you need. And we're back to Reykjavik. Uh, like any other tourist town of, of some size, uh, you have street musicians. And uh, this is uh, another piece of nice architecture. This is the National Theater, mm. uh, quite attractive building. Mm. And another building, which is just, just across the street, uh, it is, uh, I don't know what uh, the uh, use of the building is, but I was fascinated by the design of it. And you see beside it, one of these little yellow scooters, they're electric. Uh, and if you would look carefully by uh, at the, uh, uh, our, at the National Theater building, you would have seen another one. And you look just about anywhere else, you see further uh, copies of it. They are these little rental electric scooters that seem to be very popular everywhere. Now you just pick them up, ride them to where you want to go and leave them. And uh, uh, they are certainly prevalent in, in Iceland. We went to the National Museum and in it, there's some really nice artwork. Uh, this is a, a little uh, sculpture of mother and child uh, that I was particularly fond of. 
a contemporary tapestry, the bust of someone I don't know who. And uh, this is uh, what I thought of as a particularly nice uh, piece of design work. This of course is a coffee maker. May, may not be that obvious, but uh, if you boil the water over here, it siphons up through coffee filter here and there of course is your cup. I would have probably brought one of these home if I thought I could have gotten it home without breaking it anyway. But uh, you see beautiful public art uh, and lots of it, really nice design work. Uh, Iceland is an, uh, an artistic and literate country. The uh, uh, history of Iceland was, or the early history published in what they called the sagas. The uh, sagas were, they began to write them back about the year 1000. And uh, fortunately, they were collected uh, and preserved uh, mostly in Denmark. And uh, anyway, so they have a written history, which is pretty much a thousand years old. Uh, in that written history, there, is, there are reports of the fact that uh, when the Norse got there, there were Irish monks already on the island. It is disputed whether that was really true or, or uh, a little bit of literary fantasy. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, some of the, the sagas uh, are more tales than they are history. So you'd, it's a little hard to sort out what, it, what is truth and uh, what is fiction. Uh, anyway, it is a artistic, very literate uh, country. It is amazing when you consider the importance of some of the literary figures uh, that have come from there because of the uh, uh, size of the population. Uh, the population of Iceland is about one one hundredth of the population of the of the U.S. So one one hundredth or one one thousandth. Anyway, it is. 360,000 is the total population. I guess it's one one thousandth of the population of the US, but uh, has made its mark. I have a dog that is trying to get my attention right now. Uh, uh, <clears throat> anyway, it is a country that should be well known for art for literature, for design, and so on. I was very impressed by, by that part of it. It's a country that should be appreciated for the fact that it is just plain gorgeous. Uh, it is at uh, the time of year that we were there, uh, incredibly green. There were times you could see a half a dozen waterfalls without moving. Uh, it has all kinds of uh, uh, wildlife, if you like puffins, which are just incredibly attractive. Uh, anyway, it is a, uh, the people, everyone speaks English. Uh, Icelandic, you notice I didn't give many place names because the, the place names are uh, long, and incredibly difficult to pronounce, or at least for me to pronounce. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> Icelandic is basically Old Norse. Uh, when the Vikings arrived uh, speaking Norse, uh, they were isolated from Norway. And as Norwegian has evolved, uh, the Icelandic Norse has not. So if you are a literary scholar in Norway who needs an old transcript, uh, 
translated, you go to Iceland and have someone read it as though it's a contemporary piece of literature. Anyway, it's a trip I would recommend highly. Uh, we were there just as it was reopening and uh, the taxi driver said the, the uh, tourist traffic was about a third of what it would typically be at that time. So it was quite wonderful. There were never crowds anywhere that we were. There were other tourists, but not huge uh, uh, amounts of tourists. There, uh, <clears throat> the uh, roads are mostly two lane. All the roads we were on were paved. So it was quite decent traveling and the camper van was great fun. It uh, was an easy way to go. And it seems to be uh, the way that most of the travelers go. We didn't see big motor homes uh, and we didn't see very many tent campers either. It was uh, mostly camper vans that we saw. Anyway, it was a wonderful trip. Uh, I highly recommend it. Do you have any more questions? Yeah, hi, there's a couple questions. Um, did you go with an organized group? And if so, what did, what is it? And do you recommend it? And if not, how did you connect with your fellow travelers? Um, <clears throat> no, we didn't go with an organized group. Uh, I, like Jane, had been in Iceland a couple of times. That is, I'd been at the airport in Reykjavik as I was flying back and forth to Europe. Uh, so I'd seen it from the air and I'd seen it from the air a number of other times when I was flying back and forth to London. But uh, uh, so I'd always been attracted to it. But uh, uh, one of the people, uh, I have a friend named Tom Knudsen who's quite a well-known uh, environmental journalist. And uh, Tom has spent his career doing traveling the world, doing environmental stuff. Anyway, uh, he had been in Iceland two or three times before. And uh, he was one of the people we were camping with when uh, we were in Death Valley. And that got the Iceland conversation started. So he just made a list of things he thought we ought to see. And uh, since he is now retired, he had time to annotate that list. And, and uh, so we just kind of followed what he uh, decided. And then we'd vote and decide we wanted to go someplace else rather than what he had suggested. And anyway, so we just kind of meandered. But no, and it's easy to do. You know, there are enough guidebooks and stuff out there. You can easily do it on your own. You don't need uh, a, a tour group. Uh, you can find uh, camper vans on the web and things like that. So there are hotels all along also. So if you don't want to camp, um, there are hotels. Many In many cases, you see a little hotel uh, set up in a farmer's field because it happens to be about the right distance from the last hotel so that uh, you can see some that are quite isolated. I loved the pictures of the puffins that you showed in the beginning. They're so cute. Um, there are a lot of questions about the camping, the camper, um, a little bit more about um, the reservation process. Did you do it well in advance? Um, and I know you mentioned that you had some gear in the in the vans when um, when you rented them. And so there's just some some more questions about that and the camping fees at the campsites. Um, are they someone there who collects them, or is it kind of an honor system that type of thing? Both. Uh, the camping fees were you know twenty, thirty, forty dollars. Uh, Probably not 40, probably less than that. But anyway, <clears throat> they were no more than I would expect in this country. Uh, the equipment was pretty much what I had mentioned, table, chairs, uh, little camp stove, uh, uh, 
I, there was a French press, I think you saw, so I could have my coffee in the morning. I think, in fact, we had to rent it, but they, the, the uh, uh, camper people have all kinds of additional stuff that uh, you can rent from them. So for any equipment that, that might not be supplied, they, they have it available, they rent it, in, including things like sleeping bags and so on. Uh, I forgot now what. I think what, I think that was the the pretty much um, people were just kind of wondering about what the cost of the of a camper might be for a week or two. Uh, the, uh, gosh, I think we paid for two weeks. Um, you know, about eighteen hundred euros, a couple thousand dollars for a camper for a couple of weeks. And then um, now off the subject of camping, um, Sherman was asking, um, speak to how people have last names. Uh, repeat that. I, I know it's a, it's kind of an off the wall question and I'm not exactly sure. Um, I think it was when you were talking about place names. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, the question is speak to how people have last names. Okay. Last names follow a little bit of the uh, Norse tradition of having, uh, you know, a name followed by son or a name followed by daughter. So, uh, and uh, I, I don't know exactly how they are passed from generation to generation, but um, Anyway, they they typically end in son or daughter, and uh, at least the traditional names do. I don't see other any other questions in the chat. Um, does anybody want to raise their hand or ask a question of Bowie before we uh, wrap this up? Raleigh, what was the average temperature? Uh, it was like Arcata. So, you know, it was, it was kind of summer arcade temperatures. Okay. It was very comfortable. We I would like to add, uh, a friend of mine just went to Iceland. She stayed in a, I think it was Eric the Red's guest house. It was near the church. They walked everywhere around. Uh, they were able to choose a tours in small little, very nice buses. So it's small group. They'd walk to the square by the church where they would pick them up. And they had delightful experiences just based in Reykjavik. You know, as a woman, a single woman, you're very uh, comfortable doing that. It's... Oh. Yeah, thanks, Lynette. Molly, it... there's um, a couple more questions have come up. Um, one, did you need to have cash or was credit card adequate everywhere? Credit card, everybody deals in credit cards. Everybody. That, everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, even if you go buy coffee, you buy it, or hot dogs. Hot dogs are a big deal in Reykjavik. I'm not sure why, but anyway, they have famous hot dog restaurants and you can, uh, uh, pay for your hot dog with a with a credit card. That. Oh, and then um, one more question, Eva, before we get to you. Um, was there anything you would do differently on your trip? Is there anything that in retrospect you've come back and said, wait, I'll, I would have done this now or I wish I would have done that? Uh, I would have stayed for another week. You know, yeah, it was all of what I would say I would do differently was just uh, a little more time to explore, particularly uh, in the north, there were uh, things you can actually take a ferry out to an island off the north coast and cross the Arctic Circle if you want to. Uh, I've been across the Arctic Circle many times, so I didn't need, feel I need to do that. But uh, you know, uh, but I uh, would have been happy to uh, spend another week or even two there. 
That's good to know. That was a great question. Ava, you have a question. Eva? Eva Jensen? Yeah. Uh, I know stealing a car <laughs> is a really dumb idea there, but do, is there any other crime? Is there? Crime. Is there crime? Yes. Uh, not that I know of. You know, we saw nothing that uh, uh, suggested that. And, uh, you know, you don't see the kinds of precautions that people, you frequently see people uh, taking around here. Well, Raleigh, what I see in the chat is a lot of really nice thank yous and great presentations. So I really want to thank you um, for sharing with us today. I'm more intrigued than ever. I'm ready to uh, get out my passport and take a trip myself. <laughs> um, now we all want to go. <laughs> What an excellent presentation. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, yes. Thank, thank you, you ever so much. And, and please schedule us for whatever your next trip is. <laughs> well, uh, they look like fun. Or maybe you what, should take us a, on a tour of your Nebraska ranch. <laughs> well, we could do that. Uh, December 8th, Rick and I are going to tour Mongolia. So uh, for those of you who are interested in Mongolia, it's, that was an interesting trip of a couple of years ago before COVID. Yeah, that, that would be fun. We can do that. And I wanna thank everybody for coming and invite you to come back next Monday for an update on Life Care Humboldt, the new senior living option. And Thank you all for coming. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and we give thanks for all our members and our wonderful presenters. Raleigh, thank you ever so much. Oh, you're We're all very you're... envious of doing that kind of a trip. So take care. Thanks, and before you go, I did put the, um, the link to the Mongolia class in the chat for those of you who are interested in signing up for that class. Okay. Thank also, you. Thank you for including the history that made it so much more delightful. Thank you. Absolutely. It did. Oh, good.